Hi, my name is Ilias Pragotiofalos and I'm an assistant professor of international law here at the University of Utrecht. I will spend the next 10 minutes or so discussing the topic of state responsibility. Before we begin, uh, it is useful to make a, a distinction that is very important to the topic very clear. The law of state responsibility refers to the body of secondary rules that are applicable whenever a primary obligation of the state is being breached. What is meant by that is that, roughly speaking, the obligations of states can be and the rules can be divided in primary and secondary. Primary rules are obligations that uh, prescribe conduct, uh, allowing uh, or um, prohibiting certain conduct by states, uh, and secondary rules are the rules that tell us what happens when such uh, primary obligation is being breached by a state. This was a distinction that was very crucial uh, within uh, the International Law Commission, which is the body of the UN that managed to codify uh, the law of state responsibility after a very long process lasting over 40 years. The end result, the Articles on Responsibility of States for International Law from Last, which uh, were adopted in 2001, has not uh, been turned into a treaty, but nonetheless, they are considered to be customary international law, at least for the most part. So this presentation is going to be based on the architecture uh, of those articles dealing with general principles uh, at first, the wrongful life and its constitutive elements, breach and attribution, uh, then moving to the content uh, of responsibility and finally discussing a little bit the implementation of responsibility. The wrongful act consists of two main elements, breach of an international obligation and attribution of conduct to the state. Starting with the breach, it is worth mentioning that the International Law Commission did away with the subjective element of the breach. In other words, in international law, we are not interested in the intention uh, of the state that breaches an international obligation, whether it did so uh, recklessly or negligently, uh, so to speak. In other words, fault is outside the purview of the articles. The same is true for the element of damage. Damage is not an element that is required to be present in the law of state responsibility. A state might breach an obligation, not cause damage, and still be held internationally responsible. And this is, for example, the case of a state that breaches obligation to prevent transboundary environmental harm, where it can be found responsible for breaching its obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment, and environmental harm need not have to come about in order for the state to be responsible. The Articles also provide for the responsibility of a state in connection with the wrongful act of another state. The three Articles that do that are first aid and assistance. This means that a state aids and assists another state uh, to commit an international wrongful act. Direction and control, similar. A state directs and controls another state and that second state commits an international wrongful act. And coercion, a state coerces another state and that second state commits an international wrongful act. These uh, three articles uh, are also referred to as derivative responsibility simply because the responsibility derives from the wrongful act of another state. Turning to attribution of conduct, in order uh, for a breach to take place, the conduct that leads to the breach must be attributed to a state. Obviously, organs and agents uh, of the state and their conduct is attributed uh, to the state. There can be uh, ministers, there can be courts, it can be mayors, a number of officials um, of the state, and we usually look at the internal structure of the state to determine if uh, the person, the entity that adopts the conduct is an organ or an agent of the state. A state though, can also be responsible for the conduct of private persons under specific circumstances. That was the case in the Tehran hostages case in 1980 where the ICJ decided that Iran was responsible for the conduct of private entities, um, private persons rather, that uh, caused damage to the diplomatic premises of the United States uh, simply because it had an obligation to protect those premises even from the conduct of private uh, persons. Therefore, the conduct that was attributable to the state was the failure to prevent uh, the damage caused to the embassies to the embassy and the consular uh, premises. In Nicaragua, the ICJ decided that in order for a state to be responsible for the conduct of private persons, when it does not have the obligation to prevent in and of itself, it has to exercise effective control over the conduct of these private persons, meaning that essentially it has to control uh, the day-to-day -day decision making and has to be present 
uh, in all major decisions taken by these private entities. This uh, test of effective control was somewhat uh, disputed by the International Criminal Tribunal for the Crimes in former Yugoslavia. In the Tides case, albeit the decision was taken in a completely different context, that of international criminal law, the tribunal stated that in some cases the test that has to be applied is that of overall control. That means a looser um, test than the very strict uh, effective control test. The SJ had the chance to get back uh, and discuss the issue in the Bosnia uh, genocide case in 2007, where it held that indeed effective control is the prevailing test in international law for attributing conduct of private entities uh, to the state. Now, we have conduct that is attributable to the state and that leads to a breach of a primary obligation. In order for the wrongful life to be present, we need to make sure that the state, the wrongdoing state, cannot invoke uh, a circumstance precluding wrongfulness. These are consent, self-defense, countermeasures, force majeure, distress, and necessity. Uh, consent refers to the consent of the state that is supposedly uh, suffering uh, the injury from the wrongful act. Self-defense is pretty self-evident. Countermeasures will discuss a little bit on the implementation of state responsibility. Force measure refers to conduct that is beyond uh, the control of the state. Distress refers to conduct adopted by the state that is wrongful, uh, but aimed at the survival of persons. And necessity refers to wrongful conduct adopted by the state, but uh, which is adopted in order to secure and protect the vital interest of that state. Once uh, we determine that none of the circumstance preclu circumstances precluding wrongfulness um, are present, uh, we move to the content of responsibility. Then the state must seize the wrongful act and offer assurances and guarantees of non-repetition of the wrongful act of the injured state. And it also has a continued duty of performance over the obligation that it has breached. The state is also an obligation, under an obligation to offer reparation uh, for the injury it has caused. That means, is, that means to... Uh, return the situation to the status quo ante. When this is not practically or legally possible, then the state must offer monetary compensation, in other words, pay uh, damages, or provide satisfaction, which might take the form of a formal apology, uh, and sometimes even the decisions of uh, international courts uh, that clearly declare uh, the wrongfulness uh, of the conduct of the state are deemed to be uh, satisfaction. Finally, turning to the implementation of responsibility, the responsibility is implemented in two main ways. One is through the invocation um, of the responsibility of the wrongdoing state. Article 42 is pretty straightforward because uh, it tells us that the injured state may invoke the responsibility of the wrongdoing state regardless of the type of the obligation that is being breached, either multilateral or bilateral. And Article 42 uh, contains uh, the the provision on the invocation by a state other than the injured state. That means that a state other than the injured state might invoke the responsibility of the wrongdoing state in two circumstances, either on behalf of the injured state or in cases where the wrongdoing state has breached an obligation which is owed earlier on this. The second way uh, responsibility is implemented is through uh, countermeasures. These provide that an injured state uh, may determine the responsibility of uh, a wrongdoing state and adopt a wrongful conduct which leads to the breach of its own obligations as a response to the breach of the wrongdoing state. There are certain procedural safeguards uh, contained uh, in the Articles of State Responsibility and Countermeasures in order to ensure that the situation does not get out of control when it comes to illegality. This wraps up uh, a main and basic uh, out outlook of the articles and state responsibility. Thank you very much.